much hair, y'all. So much hair. Right. How's everybody doing? Pretty good? Yeah. Um, it's finally cool outside. I bet you lots of y'all are excited about that. I am not one of those people, but I bet you are. Um, I hope that you had a good week. Um, I have a cold today, so if I sound funny or if I start coughing, just, I'm good. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, it'll be all right. Um, I hope you did your homework this week. Um, it's okay if you didn't, but it's such a wonderful passage that teaches us of the grace of God and all that he has done for us, all that he is doing for us, and what he's going to do for us um, in Christ Jesus in eternity. Um, and I hope that that is encouraging to you. Um, as I studied this week and as I wrote my lesson, I just was overwhelmed by the awesomeness of what God has done in Christ for us. Um, so we come to the culmination of chapter 2 of Titus this morning. Um, and even in some sense the culmination of chapter 1 also. Um, in this beautiful declaration of Paul about God's abundant grace to us. Um, he speaks of the past, the present, and the future of salvation in this passage. And he calls us to remember and remind God's people of the amazing truth proclaimed in the gospel. You've probably heard people say many times that you need to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Um, and this passage really does tell us that that is true. As we come to the end of it, Paul tells Titus, declare these things um, because it's easy for us to forget. And so um, let's study this together this morning. Uh, I'm going to read from Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15, and we'll pray. Did I mess you up, Lauren? You good? <laughs> Sorry. I didn't even think to look up. Titus 2, 11 through 15. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it tells us of your work in salvation. It tells us at the beginning that we are fallen in sin and in desperate need of a Savior with no hope without one. But even at the beginning, you promised that a Savior would come, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, that the seed of the woman would be victorious. And we thank you that your scriptures bear that out, that as we look for the blessed hope and we wait for the appearing of Jesus the second time, that we can stand firm on the truth that he will come, because your promise that he would come the first time has been fulfilled, and we have every reason to believe you will do it again. God, I pray this morning that you would change our hearts, that you would prick us to the very core with what you have done, with what you have called us to, that you would make Jesus more beautiful and more desirable than he ever has been before. We pray that you would do this by your word and spirit, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so I said a minute ago that Paul speaks of the past, the present, and the future of salvation. And we're gonna, those are going to be our three points this morning as we talk through this passage. So first we see the past. What God has done for us in salvation. What he has completed in salvation. Paul continues chapter 2 from our session last week with the familiar shift word, for. It draws us to see the foundational truths on which the commands are built. See, in God's economy, the indicative always precedes the imperative if you're a grammar person, or perhaps easier if you're not, you always have to remember the who before the do. If you've ever been to Missy Huss's house, you've probably heard that a bajillion times. The who before the do. It has to go that way. We must grasp who we are in Christ and who God is before we step into living obedient lives. 
Otherwise, we get the gospel all mixed up, and we try to work for our salvation instead of working out of the abundance that is our salvation. Paul has given us all sorts of instructions on how to live. The ones for women, if you'll remember, are love your husbands, be self-controlled, work at home, be kind, submissive, and he goes on and on. But he does not leave Titus or us this morning to consider these commands in our own power. Which I hope for you is encouraging because if it was up to me, I'd be in big, big trouble. Um, I, j I just am not that dedicated and, I, and I'm not that powerful. I cannot fight sin on my own. But God has done it for me. So he says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. What an amazing statement. Like, step back and look at it new. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. When we think about the world, what we know about mankind, this statement should shock us. Having created man in perfection and provided him with everything for the greatest life imaginable, God is struck to the core with utter rejection from the two people he made in perfection. God had told Adam and Eve, you will surely die if you disobey. And they proved him right. They have surely died. Adam and Eve sinned in disobedience, and man has been dying ever since. Adam plunged the world into darkness, into bitter, disdainful, murderous hatred against God. And he brought with it separation from God and God's just wrath and curse. This is our status. This is the status of the world. History, history bears testimony that it is true, the darkness of the world. Cain killed Abel, and then people have been murdering one another throughout time, even yesterday. Into this chaos, the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation. The prophecy of Isaiah to Israel is repeated in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, with great wonder. The prophet prophesied, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. What is this light? The Apostle John speaks of the light as a man. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This grace has broken through the darkness. The favor of God, undeserved and indeed the very opposite of what we deserve, broke through the spiritual and moral darkness of man. Like a great blazing arrow fired through the darkest of night, the grace of God appeared. And what did this grace bring? More amazing even than the appearance of this grace is its work, salvation for all men. This salvation is described in verse 14. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. In his earthly ministry, Jesus kept that law that we break, and he gained life through the perfect obedience to God in heart, soul, mind, and strength. In his death as the perfect sacrifice, he abolished death for his people. He paid its penalty for all those who would believe in him by faith. And this salvation came to all men. We see from the context, we've talked about all these different types of people up above, and we see from this that in Jesus, salvation has been granted not only to the Jews, but as God's people to every group and class of men existing in the world. Everyone is welcomed in to the free offer of the gospel, whether you are old or young, male or female, Jew, Cretan, Gentile, free or slave. All receive the free offer of the gospel. 
No man or woman is outside of it. So that whatever group you fit into in this life, God calls you to belief in his son and holy living as laid out in his word. No one can sidestep around it. The gospel has been offered to all. So second we see in our passage the present, what God is doing in salvation. Or Paul goes on, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. With this truth before us, we see the purpose of God in redemption is not simply to snatch his people from death, but enable them to live now and into eternity. God's salvation encompasses justification, sanctification, and glorification, which we'll see in a minute. Justification is the one-time act of God whereby he pardons our sin and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by grace through faith. Yet salvation is more than just your justification, than just your salvation in your one-time belief. Salvation is also sanctification. Uh, Paul says elsewhere, work out your salvation. Well, I thought my salvation was already done. Well, it is done, but it's also ongoing. And that's what we see here. In sanctification, God works continually to renew us in our whole being after the image of God so that we are enabled more and more to die to sin and to live to righteousness. Sanctification is God's work in your life today. So what is God doing continually to save you? What is this work? Well, he's training you to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Paula mentioned a couple weeks ago that she loves that word train. And it really is a beautiful concept for us because we see that grace trains. And the picture we should get here to conjure in your mind is of a teacher who leads a child daily, step by step, in life. Um, I was thinking this week of my first grade teacher, Mrs. Childs. In her class, I learned to read and to write. We sang um, in a new program, I remember it came to our school, and so we were like the guinea pigs. Um, we sang at, at apple, b, b, ball, k, k, cat, and d, d, dog. And I got remarkably far in that yesterday when I was thinking about this. But we went all the way through the whole alphabet. I, I knew nothing, right? I mean, like, I, I didn't know my alphabet. Maybe I knew a little bit of it. I, I didn't know how to read or to write. Um, not discounting, of course, my mom's teaching at home. But I didn't know anything, and she trained me. And now I can read this. And that might seem remarkable to you that I can read this Bible because Mrs. Childs taught me my alphabet. But it's true. I can. And it all started there. Grace trains. Like a teacher, the grace of God trains its students how to order their lives in God's world. And we see this training. First, we're given the negative, what not to do, and then the positive, what it will train us to do. So let's look at those. First, grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Ungodliness is a simple word, really, but it captures so much. What is it except that which is against God? What is not like him? We see this explained in the spiral of sin in Romans chapter 1. Man does not honor God as God or give thanks to him, and so he becomes futile in his thinking with his foolish heart, darkened. As men and women reject God, they endeavor to replace him, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. They exchange the truth of God for a lie, worshiping and serving the create, creature, excuse me, rather than the creator. This is ungodliness. Whether you have 
a Buddha sitting on your coffee table in a statue form and you're worshiping it, or anything else you're trying to replace God with, all of that is ungodliness. And we do it pretty well. There's a frightening reality really in this um, as we hold our lives up to what God calls ungodliness. At the end of Romans chapter 1, and I would encourage you to read the whole thing, but at the end of Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> Paul gives us a list of what we are without God. In verse 29, he says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy. I bet nobody's done that today. Murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful. There's one I struggle with. Inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I don't really want my life held up against that list. It's a frightening reality. But the beauty of God's grace is that he trains us to renounce those things. The desires of the flesh in the world are contrary to God. And we desire them. We cannot desire anything else without the grace of God to change our hearts. And he does. The Tenth Commandment gets at the heart of worldly desire. God said, do not covet your neighbor's house, or his wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You see, the pleasures, the power, and the possessions of the world stand against godliness. And grace trains believers to renounce those things, to repudiate them, to reject them. Um, and w one thing I really want you to understand this morning, this is kind of the center of things that I've been thinking about all week. This rejection of the world, Hendrickson says this, it is a definite act, a decisive decision to give up that which is displeasing to God. No one, he writes, sleeps his way into heaven. Rejecting ungodliness is a definite act, a decision to give up that which is displeasing to God. No one sleeps his way into heaven. You see, you can't be passive. You are either killing sin or it will be killing you. If I stand here and I think about myself in this little circle, and maybe killing sin is over here, and it killing me is over here, can I sit in my little circle where neither one is happening, where I'm happy and healthy and everything's just all right? No. This, this little safe spot doesn't exist. It's either one or the other. Split the line down the middle. I'm either killing sin or it's killing me. Those are my options. And I hope that that really gets into our heads because it is the truth. And you don't want sin to be killing you. You don't. So I challenge you today with this question, if you hear nothing else, ask yourself this. What decisive act do you need to make to give up what is displeasing to God in your life? Sin will not die on its own. I have some examples, and they might hit close to home, because they hit close to home for me. But I think it's worth being super practical. Perhaps it's a TV show that you enjoy that you shouldn't watch. Stop. Maybe stopping means canceling Netflix so it's not available when you get home. This is real life. Maybe that's what it means. Maybe it means throwing your TV out the window. It just depends on what your problem is. Sin is real. Think about it. Perhaps you envy the outfits of the hip people around you or the vacations that they go on 
or the family pictures that they post that show a happy life. Stop. Maybe stopping means deleting your Facebook account or your Instagram. Not just taking it off your phone, but get rid of it. If that's what causes you to envy them. Envy is ungodliness. Perhaps you're addicted to your phone. It could be for any reason. Are you trying to escape from life? Are you trying to keep up with the Joneses? Are you afraid of missing out? Stop. Embrace the life that God has given you. Maybe stopping means putting your phone in a basket on the kitchen table when you're home. Maybe it means getting a home phone line for emergencies so that you can turn your phone off. Think about it. You might struggle so much that you need actual help from somebody else. Maybe you need accountability. Get it. Accountability is good. That's why we need fellowship in the body. Real fellowship. To say to someone, I stood at your wedding and I'm going to hold you to your wedding vows. That's what godliness looks like. To help somebody kill sin in their own lives. Also, counseling is good. Go get it. Really. If you need it. So what is it that by God's Spirit, grace is even now training you to reject? I promise we all have something. Think about it. Many of you have heard me quote this song, um, Eat You Alive by the, Hel- the Oh Hellos. Um, but this song shouts truth to me when I love my sin more than Jesus. And so I'm going to read it to you. It's short. He said to me, child, I'm afraid for your soul. These things that you're after, they can't be controlled. The beast that you're after will eat you alive and spit out your bones. She'll string you along and she'll sell you a lie. But there's nothing but pain on the edge of a knife. And there is no courage in flirting with fear to prove you're alive. I've seen the true face of the things you call life. The song of the siren that holds your desire. Death she is cunning and clever as hell. But she'll eat you alive. Oh, she'll eat you alive. This is what sin is. And sin will not die on its own. You must kill it, or it will be killing you. Consider it well as we sit here together and you hear these truths, and the Spirit convicts your heart. This is grace training you, that conviction in your soul. And you may feel confident now, even decisive or strong, like, oh yeah, I can picture that thing in my head that I need to get rid of, and I'm going to do it today. But when you pull into your driveway this afternoon and normal life returns, it may not seem so easy or so real. Then you must choose. What decisive act do you need to make today to give up what is displeasing to God in your life? Now, wonderfully, Grace's training is also positive. Grace trains us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. We can think of these three terms um, as godly living in relationship to ourselves, in relationship to others, and in relationship to God himself. Our redemption is shown in this life by change in us, and likewise change outside of us with God and others. So self-control, we've seen self-control repeated as a mark of Christian virtue over and over again in Titus, right? And here it is again. We're commanded as believers to live sensibly, to live with a thoughtful awareness of ourselves, of truth, of sin, and of God. That's what self-control is. Believers are to have desires and passions, But self-control tethers them to their proper place. Believers are to laugh. Self-control distinguishes the funny 
from what is immoral, ungodly, unkind. Believers are to live in both the serious and trivial places of life. But self-control discerns the difference so that you live sensibly. As women who live in the world, grace trains us to be sensible, not acting out of reaction to our circumstances, but considering well what is best under every moment that God has given us. And considering what that is based on what God has said. Um, in a sermon that I love, um, Pastor Alistair Begg, he's a um, minister in Cleveland, Ohio, if you haven't heard of him. He tells a story um, of attending a church that's considerably different than his own um, while he was out of town. And having waited for the beginning of the service in anticipation, um, he was struck when the worship leader entered as if on a talk show, and he opened with this line, Hey, how do y'all feel this morning? And he was like, I just don't know that that's a great question to start with. And he answers in his sermon like this, If I told you how I feel, you would question whether I was ever a Christian at all. At half past eight on a Sunday morning, I'm barely ambulatory. I can't start there. I just kicked the dog and I don't even have a dog. I argued with someone in the parking lot because they took my parking space. I spilled my coffee. I didn't read my Bible. I'm a miserable wretch. And you want me to start there? How do you feel? I feel rotten. That's how I feel. What do you got for me? Our circumstances constantly change. We're influenced and bombarded by life all around us. Yet as a believer, God calls us not to live under our circumstances, but to see ourselves and our circumstances through the truth, even when our feelings shout to the contrary. Do your feelings ever shout to you that God is not there? He is. Beg goes on to say, that's why you have to get yourself under the control of the scriptures. That's why it is what we know, the verities of the scriptures that fuel our hearts and our emotions and lead us on. Self-control, being sensible, is to stand firm upon the truth, having our minds, our emotions, our actions restrained by the bounds of the scriptures. Self-control has a standard, and that is God's law. And God's law is there to restrain bad and to promote good. The very best, remember the garden. God's law was so that the best could be sustained forever. What is it that you think or feel or do or say that pulls you to step outside of the boundaries of God's greatest good. We're trained to be upright. Grace trains us to live upright lives. That is, to live lives of righteousness. As we walk with the Lord, we should be growing in our experiences of righteousness. You see, righteous living comes as a result of being made right with God. As those who have been made right, who have been justified by grace through faith, we then move to live out that righteousness in the day-to-day -day of normal life. A righteous life, being super practical, doesn't mean moving your family to China to be missionaries, though maybe that's your call. It doesn't mean going door-to-door -door with gospel tracts or even walking the grocery store clerk through the Roman road. A righteous life means treating others as men and women who are made in the image of God. It means apologizing to your children when you sin against them. It means telling the truth when it makes you look bad or it makes, when it makes others look better than you. It means forgiving your spouse when he isn't the perfect picture of Jesus because God in Christ forgave you. 
It means speaking well of your husband in public places. It means not turning away, but opening your eyes to the broken and hurting and unlovely and giving them dignity so that they may gain Jesus through your hands and feet. Upright living in the trenches may be even harder than packing up your family and moving to China. It's a high calling that's granted to us through God's bountiful and equipping grace. He trains us to live upright lives. And finally, grace trains us to live godly lives. Many of the same truths apply here. Do you live as if God is watching? As if God is the friend who stands beside you always? To, the, to be godly is to be devoted to God and the expression of your religious beliefs, which of course we know encompass all of life. This is our Father's world. There is no distinction between the sacred and the secular. When we were in high school, my mom used to tell my sister and me when we left the house, remember, you can't check Jesus at the door. You can't put him in the coat rack and then go in without him. He is always with us. And a godly life is one of worship, always. So worship God in the gathering of corporate believers for church and in the conversations in the parking lot. Worship God both in family devotions and in doing the dishes with thanksgiving because God has provided. Worship God in studying your Bible and in sleeping with your spouse. Worship God in prayer and in playing with your children. Our self-control and daily righteousness always stem from our beliefs about God. Living in the presence of God under the control of the scriptures through the work of the Spirit changes everything. Grace is training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, right now, day after day. Training is a process. Remember that. Consider more today than you did yesterday what the training of God is making you. And consider more tomorrow than you do today. And look for the ways that God is changing you. Godliness is work. It is effort and struggle. But remember, it's not all there is. Because third in our passage, we see the future. What God will do in salvation. Verse 13, we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The glorious truth of the gospel is that this life is not the end. All of the toil and the struggle and the pain of the Christian life is for a purpose and in expectation of a prize. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 that we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. And this hope is blessed. It brings joy and it brings happiness and it brings balm to a hurting soul. It's not wishful thinking. It is not, I hope it doesn't rain today. No, it is sure. It is without question. It is realized, just not yet. The realization has simply not come. It's like saying, I hope we see a movie tonight, when you're sitting in the theater with the previews playing. You get it? Like, it's happening soon. The lights are already dark. We're all sitting here waiting. It's so soon, it's like unto now in the big picture of life. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. Not that your sufferings aren't real, but when compared with the glory, they fade away. It is coming, this glory. There was a day in Bethlehem when grace appeared. 
The angel said to the shepherds, lowly and greatly afraid, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Two appearings. There has been one. There will be another. The foundation, the motivation, the truth on which we can cling with white-knuckled fists in the midst of life's unending struggle is this. Jesus is coming again. The new life we have in Christ and are called to live finds power in the expectation of salvation's end. That we will be with him and made like him in glory. When Jesus appears in glory, he will vanquish sin and death and all the miseries that seep from Adam's first transgression. What greater incentive do we have to do the good that God has called us to than that one day we will be changed and that struggle we have for good will be struggle no longer. We will be resurrected. We will be changed. We will be holy. And only do good for all eternity. If we do not love what is holy here, why do we think that we will love holiness in eternity? As we see God's holiness as more beautiful and desirable, Paul says here we will be zealous for good works. When you grow weary of doing good, and, and you will, I do, look to the future and see salvation in the consummation of all God's promises. There is light at the end of the tunnel. It is the radiant splendor of God's glory. As Paul finishes his thoughts to Titus, he concludes by telling us that God wrought salvation, past, present, and future, to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. If you are Christ by faith today, the redemption we share this morning sets us apart. You are not a slave to sin. Jesus has redeemed you from the penalty and power that sin holds. The bonds of lawlessness are broken. A new power, the power of the Holy Spirit, dwells within you. By grace, it is training you to mortify sin and to choose righteousness more each day. We also share in purity. By faith, God has washed you white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. We sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. All of them washed away in the blood of Jesus. Made pure, we are then fit for heaven, fit for the presence of God to be his own possession. And he has made us his own the works of the world, they cannot, indeed they do not. There's no way possible for them to adorn Christ. But we have the works of godliness in our power by the Holy Spirit. So let us then be zealous for good works in light of all that God has done. Very briefly as we come to a close, Paul concludes by charging Titus to remember and to remind. He says, declare these things in verse 15. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Speak redemption, he says. Never grow weary of, weary of declaring the praiseworthy deeds of God. The gospel is the power unto salvation for all who will believe. It is the authority we have in calling men to repentance and faith in their justification and back to repentance and faith in sanctification until our faith becomes sight in the consummation of all things. The gospel is the antidote to death, to ungodliness, to doubt, to fear, to sin, 
to hopelessness. It is the truth that Jesus came in the world to save sinners, to save you. The gospel is simple and yet so often forgotten that we must forever be reminded to believe, to look back to the cross in faith, and to look forward to glory and hope. Jesus has come. He is coming again. This is our blessed hope. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful. that we stand here today with this blessed truth. That as we look at the world around us and our very lives and the lives of those we love that are wracked by sin, that we have this hope. We have the power of the resurrection that is with us now and will be for all eternity. God, I pray that you would tether our hearts to this truth, that we would stand upon your promises, upon your gospel, and that when we are tempted to step off of this foundation, that you would pull us back in the tiny things and in the big ones. That you would make our eyes gaze toward heaven, and know that it is all worth it because you are there. And when you come again, you will make us like you. And we will dwell with you forever. God, I pray this morning for every woman here that this would be their great hope. That it would change everything. Lord, if there be any this morning that do not know this hope, I pray that you would change their hearts as you would call them to the glorious truth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus, that he has died, that he has risen again, and that the righteousness that he secured is ours by grace through faith. Lord, has send us out by your mercy to live lives that renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and that are upright, self-controlled, and godly today, that we might see you for all eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.